I'm Mark Kelly and Mr. Saltwater Tank coming to you on behalf of saltwateraquarium.com. If there's one thing the saltwater aquarium industry doesn't do enough of is that we don't highlight our successes enough, especially in the area of aquaculturing fish and coral. I can't tell you how many times I've showed someone my tank or told them what I do and I say, yeah, this is all live coral. I grew this from a, a piece of coral that I clipped off from somewhere else, put it in my tank, it grows. I could clip this off and give it in your tank and if your tank is doing well, it would grow as well. It blows their mind. Why isn't this more in the spotlight so we can share and highlight our success? Now you may not know it, but since 1996, Ocean Reefs and Aquariums, better known as ORA, has been aquaculturing fish, coral, live foods, and invertebrates for the saltwater aquarium industry. Now I recently got a behind the scenes tour of their facility, and since nearly everyone watching the show is a reef junkie, I'm gonna start with the coral side of the operation. Jordan, this looks like a greenhouse, but this is for corals. This is for only for corals. Only for corals. All natural sunlight, growing the pieces that we sell to people around the world. Okay, take me inside, let's see. Let's go take a look. Finally, I get to see what makes ORA tick, and I get to see some of my favorite ORA corals up close and personal. Jordan, this looks like a vat of anything and everything. It's a little bit of everything, but a lot of these you'll see are the horizontal growing corals. We've got everything from monoporas, pectinias, plating monoporas, scroll corals, and one of my favorites, the red goniopora. How long ago did these come out of an aquarium or the wild? The red goniopora that you see here uh, took a, close to 10 years to become commercially available just on the scale we wanted to sell it at. Okay. So when we get a new fresh frag that we want to put into production, it's, it's going to be at least a five year time frame to get enough to sell on the scale needed for the domestic demand. So how much is that? Is that 100 frags you want for your initial run, do you know? Uh, thousands. Thousands. Typically, yeah. Because the last thing you want to do is sell out because you can't just make them like that. We can't just make it. We can't just go get more from the wild, right. Okay, so something comes in once and then it gets grown and fragged. So if it comes in, we put it into our quarantine tanks. Uh, where it'll stay there for at least six months before it even touches this building. Uh, we're making sure there's no parasites, no flatworms. Then it comes into here, we grow it out. Uh, once it gets large enough, we'll make frags of that, and then frags of those frags, and frags of those frags, and uh, until we get a number that we're comfortable with uh, revealing. And there's a really big clam in the corner. Oh yeah, yeah, that one's got some history. Let's go have a look at that. ORA wouldn't let me put a measuring tape underwater, so you gotta trust me on this one. This clam is huge. This is big. That is a big clam. This is uh, what most people don't get to see in the hobby is kind of an adult size Tridacna duracea clam. This is 24, 30 inches across. At least, yeah. And how long has it been here? This is probably a 10 year old clam, at least. They actually grow pretty fast, but this is uh, this one's been here a while. Did it come here 10 years ago? We have, I think we've had it closer to 10 years. And prior to that, it was at someone else's public or home aquarium. So it could be 15 years old sitting right there. At least, yeah. Wow. So we've got a big clam, we've got lots of coral. I'm guessing you need lots of filtration to make that happen. So we use a lot of filtration. We run it through carbon, we run it through sand, and as you can see, we've got these gigantic, like, building-sized protein skimmers. Okay, let's go have a look at this. So big skimmer, where's the big calcium reactor and the big RO system? We don't need one. We use all of our water comes up from a saltwater well. So we get everything an Aquarius needs, the calcium, the magnesium, the alkalinity, all right in the water. So no trace supplementation, none of that? None needed. Okay, and there's no lights in this building either? No, we've kept our electrical costs very low by just using Florida sunlight. Do you find that since we're using natural sunlight, corals don't look as Aquarius think they would look because they're not under some blue light? I think people would be very surprised at the color you get just from natural sunlight. Uh, I find a lot of these corals are as bright, if not brighter, than you would get under an actinic lighting. However, the one downside is we do have shifting light levels throughout the year. Wintertime we get less light, for summer we get a lot of light. So you will see some corals uh, fluctuate their coloration during those times. Do you see a, a big change in growth? More summer growth, less winter growth? It's weird. Some corals grow really, really fast during the summer and slower in the winter, and then some grow really fast in the winter and less in the summer. And likewise with color. Some corals, we get really great color out of the summer sunlight. Some corals do much better in the more dimmer, lower light of the winter. So are you moving things around, putting cheesecloths over them? Trying Constantly, to that? yeah. We are moving corals from here to over there, over there to over here. And sometimes the same variety of coral will look completely different depending on where it is in the greenhouse. 
Wow. So it's a different type of struggle then. You don't have to maintain pH and alkalinity, but now you're managing sunlight. Sunlight and temperature. Temperature is really crucial. I mean, you can hear these big fans we've got. Uh, we've got gigantic chillers. Being in a greenhouse, it gets pretty hot in here during the summer. How warm is your water temp you're trying to maintain? We try to keep it around 78, 82, right around that same range in Aquarius we keep it at. So any heaters in the winter? Uh, usually it's not needed. I mean, this can actually trap a lot of heat. Okay, but in the summer you're opening things up, running fans, running chillers. Yes, yes, trying definitely. Trying to manage heat. So we've got natural seawater handled, no supplementation, protein skimming, free sunlight. Right. What kind of problems besides heat do you have in this facility? The same struggle I think any Aquarius could uh, uh, relate to, algae. So our staff out here is using elbow grease all day, every day, scrubbing algae off all of our corals. But you've got some tangs in here, they can't keep up. They can't keep up, no. This is too much light. Too much light? That must be tough. A lot of light has to mean a lot of large mother colonies, and like a lot of times when it comes to coral size, large is relative. So I'm not seeing some three-foot mother colony in this tank, but you're telling me this is your mother's you frag from. So this is what's unique to our form of aquaculture. So we take pieces, we grow them out uh, to something like this, right? And then from here, we take pieces of that, grow those out, and then sell to the aquarium something about this size here. So that's an ORA normal size frag then? Correct, yep, right and around that size. And that's an ORA mother colony. I would call this a mother colony, right. So you have, I'm looking at probably 40 mothers right here. You can take 100 frags and not even make a dent in these. Correct, yeah. I mean, just keep cutting and cutting until uh, we've got all we need. But just like with any kind of production, we can slow down if the market doesn't want any more. We can speed up if we uh, need more colonies. Now, do you have some here and then this coral is in another building as a backup in case this crashes for some reason? We like to keep same corals in different trays throughout the building. So we've got multiple systems so that if anything should happen to one system, we at least have multiple others uh, protected. But I'm noticing also that there's no flow. I don't see any power heads in this tank. Right. One of the other reasons and way we're able to keep our costs down uh, is limiting the electrical usage of multiple power heads. So in a usual aquarium, you'll have vortex, you'll have rios, you'll have all sorts of stuff moving water around. We use these big Lavex garbage cans. So uh, water comes in and it's like a surge system? Correct, this is called the Carlson surge device. So water goes in, it fills all the way up to this 45 gallon mark, and then once the siphon breaks, you get you know, six inches of water boom, blasting through here, uh, circulating all the corals, getting all the detritus out, going down these drains, keeping these corals growing normally, as you would in the wild. So other than algae, scrubbing algae maintenance, there's not a lot to maintenance to do on these corals and just let them grow. Right, it's purely uh, just algae control. And watch your corals grow. And watching these corals grow into these beautiful, colorful pieces. I mean, it doesn't sound like a bad life for the corals or for you guys. No, they have a good time. So you create a frag and then you put them on those rubber ORA frag plugs that you can't cut to save your life. You hate them, don't you? I'm not gonna say I hate them because I love the coral that's in them. Right. But why, what's the story behind that? All right, I agree. These are big, these are bulky, these are kind of not user friendly for the most you know, beautiful reef tank to have this big thing sticking out of the rocks. But we actually use these more for us and less for you. Okay. And that goes back to my earlier point about how much flow these things can produce. If you had just a standard frag plug sitting on these egg crates, that, blow, that flow coming out of there would blast these corals all over the tank, they'd branches everywhere, it would be awful, it would be a nightmare. So we had these plugs specially designed to wedge so tightly in this egg crate that you can literally pick it up, turn it down, they won't fall out, they won't get blown around. Uh, it makes keeping these corals nice and unbroken uh, very easy for us. So that's why it's rubber, so it gives a little bit but locks in there. It's not rubber, it is a hard, hard, plastic ceramic there. But you can't cut oh, it with your bone cutters. We don't want you to cut it. We also want you to know that this came from ORA. It says right on there. Yes. You can't miss it. If you know that, if you see that, you know it's an ORA plug. It and came I here know, from Florida, right. It came from here and I'm not getting the coral out. It is, it'll be a permanent resident in your aquarium. No, you can't. I really, one well, of my favorite things to do is if I have a coral, I'll use a bone shear, I'll cut right at the base, clip it off, put that on my rock, this can go back in my frag ray tray and become a new coral. So we're continuing the aquaculture for generations and generations. Even at the home aquarium level, yes. That's fantastic. All right, so we've, we've talked a lot about corals. 
which I argue is, you know, fish get you into the saltwater aquarium hobby, but corals really get us addicted. You guys are known for fish as well. Oh yeah, we've got a number of different species, over 147 species under our belt. Okay, let's go have a look at that. All right. Mm -hmm. 